there are some things going on in the world today that require anonymity systems, and there are some adversaries that don't want people to have those anonymity systems. And so I want to briefly introduce Tor as a project. We're a nonprofit. Um, but I also want to talk about the actual system we have, how it's deployed in the world, and some practical things. So we'll talk a little bit about theoretical anonymity, but we're also going to talk about the practical stuff in the real world. So we're going to bridge academia with um, real world relevant stuff, I mean, in the best way possible. Um, so the lessons learned here, we'll talk a little bit about blocking and talk a little bit about filtering. Um, and then hopefully we can talk about ways to improve afterwards, because um, I'm sure that there are lots of things that would be useful. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll get into that. So Tor is a nonprofit, so we're a 501c3. And the idea here is that we don't think that we can save the world if we are a for-profit company. And we don't think that we can really contribute to uh, an open knowledge base if we're uh, stuck and constrained in the for-profit model. So we created a nonprofit, and we work really closely with universities and researchers. We like to work with everybody from the Google Summer of Code to the EFF to universities to even we'll take funding from anybody because whatever money comes in, we make sure that whatever we produce is shared with the whole world. So we're probably the only project that's been funded by both the Electronic Frontier Foundation and also the Department of Defense. Um, <laughs> hey, that's, I also I find that funny, especially because I work at Tor. Um, so um, the Tor network itself um, is built from an open specification. And that open specification is in an RFC style. So um, if you've ever read an RFC, you know the shoulds and the musts and the, and the, the wills and the won'ts. And so we have the same thing. Um, We've had people that have in independently implemented Tor and as a client and as a client that connects to the network. And so we've actually had different implementations of Tor of our specification, which as a result has allowed us to see that we've, for example, made mistakes in our specification or in our C reference implementation. And that's been really helpful. So we have a lot of people um, working on that. The current count as of last night was 2,325 active relays in the network. So that's quite a lot of people that were running Tor as a relay wanting to help out. Um, and as of last night, also, we had around a quarter of a million active users. And so this is an anonymity network, so of course it's kind of difficult to know exact numbers for the users because we don't just have a database where we look up and say how many users are on the network right now. This is, it's, it doesn't work that way. So it's a statistical sampling, and all of this data um, we really believe that open data and transparency is important. So all the data, as well as the tools that give these stats, are published on metrics.torproject.org. So you can basically say, OK, we have that information. And it's collected in a privacy-preserving way. So when we say we have 100 users from a particular country, we don't give you the IP addresses. In fact, the relays that collect this statistical information, um, they only collect it in a privacy-preserving way every 24 hours. Um, so we don't reveal information about clients, even though we're able to, to learn about general trends. Um, and the network itself varies, but around uh, the last like uh, couple of weeks, we've gone, I believe, somewhere between four to six gigabits. So it's an overlay network that's like quite large at this point. Um, so that's the general overview, the big picture, as we call it, of Tor. So we've got free software, open specifications, a nonprofit, and we like to collaborate with a lot of people. So if you're interested in any of the stuff that we talk about, I mean, I don't know if there's funding. There might be funding. Um, but we are always looking to collaborate with more people because anonymity is a really hard thing. And every time you have a, a vulnerability, like a security vulnerability, uh, it leads to an anonymity compromise, for example. So there's a lot of practical programming stuff that is important to think about. But then there's also real hard anonymity problems like just side channel attacks. Uh, that I was talking about with one of the students here. You know, they have really good side channel attacks. How do those work, and how do they stack up against Tor? In theory, maybe they work. How do they work on the real Tor network? We built the Tor network so people could use it. Part of that is, for example, my passion, which is about human rights and journalism and free speech. But you know, Roger's passion, Roger Dinglebein, who founded the Tor Project, his passion is, of course, about research in anonymity. He wanted to create an anonymous communications channel. and. Um, if any of those things are interesting to you, you can come talk to me after the talk or ask questions or whatever. Um, depending on how we want to present it, we have a couple different ways of framing it. So I, I think that it's important to remember that when I say anonymity, that means absolutely nothing to almost anyone. And it's really about context. And what I want to talk about today is not network security for businesses or traffic analysis uh, resistance 
for a government who's worried about other government actors. Um, but I really care about uh, the traffic analysis uh, resistant uh, component along with blocking, so censorship resistance. Um, so what that means for most people is that they want to be able to reach a particular site. They want to reach that site without alerting people that they're visiting that site. And they want to make sure that the site doesn't learn anything about them except what they reveal. And so Tor provides these properties and more. And largely for blocked users, um, this is quite an improvement over what they were previously using. With the exception of VPNs, which are just one-off and don't really scale and have a whole bunch of other problems like observation, like the person that runs your VPN can observe everything that you do. And so they can, of course, target you. They can be compromised. They can be compelled. Um, so Tor, Tor improves on that in, in, a, in a pretty big way. And also, it ensures that the, the, the last part, um, which is this uh, privacy from source and destination networks, includes the privacy of, of knowing that it's very hard for someone to target you, to know that you are the person that they want to attack, or that you are the person who is visiting a site and has uploaded a particular video. Now, there's some side channel information, and we can get extremely technical about this, but obviously, if you're in a country and it doesn't have a lot of internet penetration and you're the only Tor user and you send 10 gigabytes of data and then later 10 gigabytes of data is found to have been an important number and someone was recording that, of course Tor can't help you with that particular problem because that side channel is very powerful. And in fact, short of using a satellite internet connection, you'd have a pretty hard time getting around state telecom for, for that type of thing. Um, you could do smart things like chunk it up or, or create smaller sessions, but you know, there's still some assembly required for users, especially when there's real serious threat models. Like what's happening in Egypt right now is an example of a place where people will really need to think hard about what they're doing to stay safe. Because if you just try to use Tor right out of the box, it might not be the right thing. It might be perfectly fine for you. They might be busy shooting innocent civilians in the street. And so in that case, they might not be working on advanced traffic analysis things. Um, so. Is anybody here actually familiar with how the Tor protocol works at all? Got a few. Okay, so Tor is essentially an anonymous TCP overlay. There are some exceptions. For example, when you want to know the name of Google.com, we can resolve the name of Google.com through Tor. Normally, that's a process that uses UDP because DNS uses UDP. We have a way using a SOX proxy and also some other interfaces that we expose so that you can use the normal DNS resolution process for either SOX 4A or for DNS to actually get that name back. It's limited, though. So that's sort of the outside of the TCP scope part of Tor. And then the rest of it is that we have a series of nodes all around the world, and these are called relays or onion routers. And these onion routers, when they turn on, they connect to a series of trusted directory authorities. And I'll, and I'll show a little picture of this in a second. Um, and what they do is they connect and they say, I am a router in uh, some country somewhere, in some place. Here's my IP address. Here's my cryptographic key. Here's my email address if you wish to contact me about any problems. And then the, the directory authority has received this information along with all the other directory authorities. And all the directory authorities get together and they have a little powwow and they say, like, I can reach this server. This is what I've observed about that server. And after about an hour or two, it comes down that all of the servers that are seen in common between all of the simple majority of those directory authorities, um, those servers get put into what we call the consensus. And the consensus is a snapshot of what the network is at that time. And the, the directory authorities assign certain flags. Like So for example, if you allow people to leave your Tor server, or you're an exit node, as we call it, um, those servers would be assigned the exit flag. And so clients make all of their routing decisions based on the consensus. So when a Tor uh, is started on your computer, what you do is you connect to any of these relays or to the directory authorities, and you download this list. And you learn about all the possible places in which you can build connections. And so when you do this, you build what we call a circuit, which is you take this list, you pick three Tor routers, and then you construct a telescoping encrypted connection. So you connect to the first one, and then you connect through the first one to the second, and the second to the third, and then from the third you extend your circuit by attaching a stream to it, and you attach the stream to this extended circuit to wherever it is you wish to go. And so we actually don't <coughs> shuffle TCP across. We only shuffle the bytes of the stream itself. 
And so what you have in this case is um, the first circuit knowing who you are in terms of IP addressing. They don't really know anything else other than that. But they don't know where you're going, except the second hop. The second hop knows you're coming from the first, and the third knows you're coming from the second. And the third, of course, knows you're going to Amazon.com to look for some gifts for someone or something like this. But they have no idea that you're connecting here or from here. They don't learn that. So this is a concept that we call privacy by design. The idea is that we segment the different pieces of the network up so that any one party can only learn so much information about you, and the amount that they can observe is relatively small. And so this is, I think, quite important because it means it's very hard to compel things. So for example, all the relays use ephemeral keying. So you connect to the first relay, and you set up a cryptographic key, and it does a half-authenticated Diffie-Hellman. And so you know you're talking to the right relay, but the relay doesn't know anything about you. And after a certain amount of time when the circuit is torn down or when you willfully tear the circuit down, it is at that time that the key is destroyed. And so these, these keys, lots of different keys exist inside of Tor, but they're all regularly destroyed. So the biggest thing you get by taking a server is the ability to impersonate that server, um, which in itself is not really that important. Um, even if you're a really fast, popular server, it's not so important. Um, so of course, you choose your path, you're on the internet, congratulations, you're done. You're now using Tor. We expose that as a SOX proxy, and all that stuff happens automatically. So that whole crash course right there, you never really need to know any of that. Um, but it, that's basically the process. Um, there's, some, there's some ways forward I think will be, that will be really important in the future, like when you build that path. Maybe you want to build a path that says, I want one NATO country, I want someone that's not a NATO country that's not friendly to NATO, and then I want to like uh, go somewhere that is close to the network that I want to visit eventually. So some kind of geographic circuit, uh, like specifically routed based on geography or politics. It's not implemented now, but you could do that. It would be possible. And for your particular threat model, that might be important. It totally depends on you. Uh, but right now, it just works. It selects, it has a, a our specification talks about the client um, selection method for routing. And um, I can answer questions about it. But So this is sort of what I mentioned before, where you have you have these relays. They publish to the, direct, uh, the trusted directories. Different, um, different relays that are not trusted directories actually act as caches, and those caches will keep the consensus on them. So once you've bootstrapped by connecting to the trusted directory authorities, which are hard-coded into your Tor program, um, once you've connected to them, uh, you will essentially have a list of all the other places where you can get the network. So this scales really nicely because it means that you can connect to a cache basically after you've touched it once. And it, you know, it rotates, but a lot of those nodes are there for a long time. Like I've been running a server in Amsterdam, which you know, is somewhere between 500 megabits and a gigabit of Tor traffic a second. And it's been there for a couple of years. And thanks to the founders of Access for All, I don't pay more than 100 euros a month for that server. Um, that, for example, if you learn about that one server, you, you for, you're good for two years, in theory. Uh, in practice, there are some details that need to be worked out, but it's pretty easy. So Alice will just build a connection by grabbing that cached consensus. And the way that, that Alice does this, as I said, is this telescoping encryption. And so these, uh, these relays are, of course, chosen by Alice. So are there any questions so far about this? Because I know that that was a lot to take in. If you've never even heard of Tor, for example, that probably is just like way too fast. Um, so, yeah? But can you ensure that these uh, servers that you choose aren't owned by the same person or in some way taken over? OK, yeah. So um, the question was, how do you ensure that these servers are not owned by the same person? And you know, that's a, a general class of attacks, civil attacks in anonymity systems. And the short answer is, you can never be too sure. But there are certain things that give it away. So for example, um, for a while, I decided that server in Amsterdam was really useful, but I wanted more diversity of IP addresses. So I wanted to add, um, I got a class C of IP addresses. And I had 255 IP addresses, of which some were usable, not all of them. And I decided that I would um, basically start a bunch of Tor servers. Well, Tor knows that if you see 250 Tor servers in 1 slash 24, that they are definitely controlled by at least the same adversary in terms of network sniffing capability. Now, so even if I'm totally honest, Tor will only pick one from that. And in fact, we do that for an entire slash 16. So any, any network block that is inside of uh, slash 16, we will only choose one node from them. 
Additionally, if you want to play nice, which I do with my Tor servers, you have an option that's called My Family, where you have to have a bidirectional link that you say, I run server one and I run server two. And server two says, I run server two and server one. Now the Tor clients know that you're playing along, you're playing nice. And as long as enough people do that, and an attacker doesn't have like 200,000 slash 16s of their own, for example, that would be one of the ways that we would avoid that. Now, if you have an attacker who's performing a civil attack and has a great diverse range of IP addresses, it is possible that they can inject <coughs> enough nodes into the network that you would start to pick their servers, and they might be able to do some things. Because what Tor protects against is, is you know, everything that is not end-to-end -end traffic analysis. So if you can watch the last hop and the first hop, you can watch the bytes go in here, and you see like a little spike on your byte counting graph, and then you watch them come out over here, and they're the same. There's a one-to-one -one mapping. The difference is the latency that it takes. And so you can calculate that. And there's other attacks that you can do on Tor, but the main one that we cannot protect against is a global passive adversary that can watch the whole internet. So the geographic, the geographic diversity of the routers is really important. Because, for example, we all know that the NSA wiretaps the entire United States without warrants, right? Everybody knows that? That's not a surprise to anyone? Is that a surprise to anyone, I guess, is the question? So thanks to the treasonous behavior of AT&T, we know that that is something that is not safe for America, right? So if you build Tor circuits in America, you have to build Tor circuits that leave America. Of course, if you're now going to a website in the United States, there's some question about whether or not it's safe uh, from NSA, TNT or not, but it's, uh, it's not clear about, about how we would deal with the American, the American situation. But um, if you, for example, have a threat model of being in Egypt and you want to upload a video to YouTube, then as long as you are crossing network boundaries that are outside of their surveillance capability, you have a lot better of a chance, right? So it really depends on where the different resources are located also. Um, because, of course, if you only control one relay and you happen to be the entrance relay, but you also can sniff all of the web traffic of the Alexa Top 1000, you can also be on the other side of that end-to-end -end correlation without attacking the Tor network at all. So, that, I mean, the deep packet inspection industry is a pretty scary one, and um, that's something that's very hard to defend against. And so that's the, the geographic circuit diversity thing I mentioned is, will be really important for that. Because I'd like to be able to say, route me through Antarctica, uh, route me through China, take me out through Sweden, you know, and, and then I want to visit a website in China. I'm pretty sure no one is going to know who I am in that case. Um, it's really hard to be sure in an absolute circumstance, of course, especially because wiretapping is essentially, in a lot of countries, uh, either written into the law or it's implied that it's totally fine to do it because everybody's doing it. So, I mean, with all systems that exist other than Tor, you're lost in that situation, too. That's the worst part, right? So no matter what you're doing, Tor is certainly better than everything else that's out there if they're targeting you. For, for the case of, like, well-known protocols, wouldn't it be possible to, like, insert data into the stream such that you can't do the sort of packet analysis at the end? Um, could you rephrase that? So for well-known protocols, it should be possible to inject data into the into the data stream that Tor is transmitting, mm -hmm. such that the thing that's going in isn't exactly the same as what is coming out in terms of number of bytes, but it's functionally equivalent to. Are you talking, so that's a, that sounds like a general class of attacks we call tagging attacks, where you're tagging things. So if you sit in the middle, you, you we, we send everything inside of uh, 512 byte cells. So we build these, these are TLS connections. So this is TLS and these are TLS, and these are multiplex. So all the connections from R1 to R2 are going over this TLS connection. And then you send a bunch of cells, and you have different uh, you have different circuit IDs that are available to relay one and relay two that are not shared outside of that. And relay two could, for example, flip some bits inside of those inside of those cells. And we do try to defend against those types of things, but those kinds of tagging attacks uh, in general are are they don't they don't break that threat model. Even if you can tag, you would be able to know that the integrity of those uh, packets. Right. Have so I did not mean it as a form of attack, but as mm -hmm. a form of ensuring anonymity. Because if somebody is able to watch the entry point and the exit point, mm -hmm. the data doesn't look the same. Then they wouldn't be able to tell if it's the same thing. Sure. So the thing is that if you were watching the entry and the exit, you're you you're lost. Even if you're changing those bits, right? Because um, the reason I mentioned the tagging attack is that if you have um, if you have someone that's flipping those bits, people can tell that those bits are being flipped. And if you if you were changing the common protocol, 
it won't really matter anyway because Relay 1 only sees encrypted data, and Relay 2 only sees encrypted data, and Relay 3 does decrypt the data um, and potentially decompresses it. There's lots of things that could happen there, um, depending on what protocol it is and what kind of attack would be running on the exit node. But the, the short answer is that if you were to change that, you would still have pretty much one-to-one -one correlation of the byte going in and the byte going out. And there's a lot of, there's an open question about whether or not um, when these are like running at 10 gigabits a second, if you can do that kind of analysis. And that's a really good question. Like at scale, do those attacks work? And we don't really have a good answer for that yet, um, especially because these connections are multiplexed. But that's a little inside baseball. So let's, uh, um, I kind of covered this. But basically, if you have a single hot proxy, you have the ability to be targeted, you have the ability to be wiretapped, there's all sorts of really bad stuff that happens with a single hot proxy. And not the least of which is that you have, you do have the very serious problem of politicians and wiretappers getting together to have a little ball. And you know their wiretappers ball is a pretty serious one. So single hot proxies just will not protect you, um, I believe. And also there's some question about incentives. Who runs a single hot proxy and why do they do that? And what do you know about them? Totally depends. For example, I know that there are some government agencies that run single hot proxies because they want to help people and trying to get information. There is some question about the people that run those proxies about what they do with that information. Like maybe they use that for intelligence gathering, for example. You know, sometimes people will run proxies so they can just send it to intelligence agencies for fun because they're good Samaritans. That's something that's a little bit scary. So even if you have an encrypted connection to the single hot proxy that says nothing, of course, of what the proxy does with the information, and the mere fact that they know potentially who you are and where you're coming from and where you're going to and what you're saying is really bad to put into one thing. So you know, you could have just one computer. The early remailers had just a single computer with a cable going in, and you would send a packet to it or an email right, in this case. And then it would do a lookup in the table, and it would know, and it would forward it on. So someone just watching that single cable can just build a small packet sniffer, and they can see quite clearly what's going on. And they can see the information going in and out. Um, there were improvements on the Mixmaster network side of things, but even still, it's very difficult um, it's very difficult to build anything that looks like a single hop and pretend that there's any kind of security, even when you have delaying. Like if you have 100 people putting in messages and the messages aren't padded to the same fixed size when they're sent in the first place, then you have no idea about you know, um, the security that it will offer you. And, and I think it really doesn't offer you any. And so multi-hop proxies really offer a lot. If you're, if you're a target of surveillance and the government is interested in you, and there's things, and I understand that you don't know what the, where it's coming from from the end user, but if you're a target, can the government or whoever's interested find out before it's actually gone to the relay what you're communicating and what you're interested in? Well, so um, that's a question about observability. And so I guess for the people that might not have heard that in the other room, um, the question is about local adversaries being able to surveil you, like before you've made any connection to anything else, when you're sending data doing the setup. Is that right? Um, so the short answer is no. That's one of the exact things Tor is designed to protect you against. Now, if you go to a popular website like Google, and you only download Google, there is the possibility of an SSL type fingerprinting attack, where if you download exactly 455 bytes, and then exactly 200 bytes, and then 300 bytes, and you do it with very specific timing information, you can infer that someone just went to Google. Um, so that, that is possible with pretty much everything. We tried to minimize that by making 512 byte cells so that we had some of the data up, but there's still a question of the number of cells. And of course, like I said, if you downloaded, for example, a video that is very popular on the internet and it's a weird bite size, which could be because usually when people produce videos, they don't pad it up to the nearest size. Um, and if they did, they would be the only ones that did it. Um, so um, if you were to do that, it is possible that they can learn that bit of information. But the actual communications themselves are encrypted. So it isn't a certainty. And when you build your connection to that first relay, the idea is that anyone watching that only sees your encrypted TLS connection. And even if they could break the encrypted TLS connection, which is like the equivalent of secure banking, only a lot more secure because we don't include certificate authorities in the mix, um, then you would have these relay cells. And the relay cells themselves are also encrypted. And this is with the session key that has forward secrecy. So an observer would not be able to learn very much about you in a practical sense, I believe. And if anyone has evidence to the contrary, I would very much like to know. Um, so the, the cell padding starts at the client then? Yes. 
That's correct. So the client actually takes uh, data that comes to the SOX proxy locally, and it, it does all of this stuff for you. So when it actually makes the TLS connection out, no user is hand coding or typing up those cells. Tor automatically does it um, all the way. So there's a problem with this, which is, the, of course, uh, the problem with any source routed protocol, which is that um, let's say that there's a government and, um, and or a large corporation, or let's just go with all of the above, and they want to block Tor. And they want to block Tor for a number of reasons, usually relating to the fact that they're fascists. And so, um, so what they do is they download the list, and they download that list and they put it into their firewall. And um, they don't care why you're using it or what your legitimate reason for using it or because of the fact that the internet is totally insecure, and so you want to move to a different part of the internet, which is closer to where you want to go to secure yourself. Like, there's tons of reasons you would use Tor where you don't even care about the anonymity thing. Like, I chat with people online on Gmail, and they use Tor, and they use it for reachability. And they also do it so that if there's ever a problem with SSL, they won't fail in a way where their local network will see them failing. And so there's lots of reasons that you would want to use it. Of course, there are plenty of people that just don't care about that. And so they download the list of all the servers on a regular basis, and then they put them into their firewalls and they block them. This is hilarious, though. I run one of the directory authorities. And so what that means um, is that I control firewalls, <laughs> right? I'm not like particularly, uh, I, I don't abuse that um, any more than running a tour relay. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting to note that you have this, this kind of weird relationship. And you have to have this relationship. Because in order to have an anonymity network that is source routed, everyone has to have the same view. Otherwise, you have a kind of fragmentation. And when you have fragmentation, you have the ability to perform segmentation attacks. So like, if I only serve you a view of the network and him a view of the network, I don't need to know directly what you guys are doing, but I can tell who you are based on which parts of the network you use. So everyone has to have the same view, or everyone has to have a very similar view, or you have some really serious observation problems right off the bat. Um, but if everybody in the room is using the same thing, we can't learn anything about which servers we connect to and what servers we leave from. And because it's a clique topology, that's, that's really a hard problem. So that, of course, makes scaling a big pain, right? Because once you start to talk about making like a 10,000 or 100,000 node network, then you have potentially some serious trouble. So they block us a lot. So for example, this is the case in uh, China right now. And we're losing pretty badly in China. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this is unavoidable if we want strong anonymity. So there's a trade-off here. Um, we could try to make a darknet. But you know the thing about darknets is that they largely are just hand-waving. Like lots of computer hackers like to talk about darknets and stuff, but it doesn't stand up to anything when it comes to academic rigor. Like you look at a darknet and it falls over. So um, what you have to have is something that is strong, that actually holds up on paper. And unfortunately, the thing that we believe is best is this thing where we reveal to clients all the information they need to make the decisions that are best for themselves. So like people often email and say, gosh, you know, I have the solution to all of your problems. Don't allow clients to choose their route. Just open a connection to the first server and make your connection. And of course, like that's a brilliant idea, except that it's awful. And um, <laughs> what it means is that um, the first relay, if they are not trustworthy, you're screwed. And so the idea here is that with privacy by design, where we have segmentation of PII, we also want to make sure we have security in that privacy by design. And so we have to have segmentation of different rights and responsibilities and abilities. So we have to make sure that there's a, like a, a trade-off. And the trade-off is that in a lot of ways allows for easy blocking. But that's OK. We have some ideas for how to solve that. Um, another thing that's kind of hilarious, um, some of the places I've traveled, like I try to log on. I have a history of working for places that like to get blocked on the internet. And um, so like I, I used to work at a small independent film company that specialized in online rehabilitation videos. And that was always blocked everywhere um, you know, for various reasons, also because they're fascists. Um, but Tor is blocked everywhere as well. Um, and what that means is that if you want to get a copy of Tor, you have a bootstrapping problem now. And so it's like, oh, so you block our network sometimes, you block our website. Oh, that's really annoying. Um, but the thing that's awesome is that most of the sensors actually use Tor, which is kind of funny, or some of the sensors actually use Tor. And so what they really do is they just get the low-hanging fruit to make it look like they've tried. I've actually, um, when I was traveling in Qatar, uh, I went to train some people from Al Jazeera about Tor. And uh, 
I had a funny experience at the airport here as a side note, which is that I was trying to learn about what was happening in Egypt. And so I asked the woman at the airport if she could put on Al Jazeera. And she said, Al Jib what? <laughs> anyway, it's kind of funny. So I traveled to, to train the, uh, the people at Al Jazeera in Qatar about, uh, about Tor. And I found that the QTEL Telecom actually blocks the Tor Project's website. And so in order to get a copy of Tor to the people at Al Jazeera, um, I wanted to download it before I went to their office, uh, I used a thing called GetTor. And so we decided that we would use a different overlay network to deliver our overlay network. So we use email. And like spam filtering is really a hard problem. So we decided that we would also make a really hard problem. So some mail servers, they have uh, start TLS. So they have encrypted peer-to-peer -peer connections for sending data. So we just set up uh, GetTor at torproject.org. And if you can reach Gmail or Yahoo or I wouldn't use Yahoo, but if you could, if you could, uh, you know, because they put Shi Tao in jail, right? So um, I don't want to promote them for corporate collaboration, considering they're like a really bad human rights record. Um, so um, you email get Tor, and um, basically uh, you get yourself a copy of Tor, and it's great. It's actually a remote shell that I wrote. So you you say like, oh, I want the source, and it sends you the source code. Or you say, I want the Tor browser bundle, which includes Mozilla Firefox, Tor, Vidalia. Uh, and all, you know, in a chat program, and we send you that. And they're GPG signed. So if you can just find our public key now, which is totally on a different overlay network, that's on the PGP key servers network. Um, so you see that the, the, the blocking game gets really hard for sensors very quickly. They could go and block all of those things, but the collateral damage from doing that would pretty much cripple them, right? If all email providers were blocked, uh, that would be bad for, for, for them in general and sensors. So they don't do that. So this is actually quite stable. Uh, to give you an idea, here's how many people are using it in the last few months. So we had an event around New Year's, it looks like, where we popped up. I don't know if that's actually accurate. Um, a good question. But, you know, we, we average, you know, about 500 or 250, depending on when it is. It could be zero some days, 100 there. But <laughs> apparently there was a blocking event somewhere in the world. I don't know where. But, like, for example, I was doing a, um, a training in Hong Kong for some people, and uh, they... Um, heard that Gmail was going to get blocked, and so they quickly went and downloaded and they Twittered about like how you could get it. And, and they also Twittered the Chinese version of this Twitter uh, program. I don't remember what it's called. Um, but basically they Twittered, oh, but if it's blocked, send an email. And so apparently that person that Twittered that was like really influential online. And so our mail server was just like overloaded with tons of requests. And so it would look probably something like this. I think we sent out 10,000 copies of Tor via email that day or something crazy. Um, so people use this. It's kind of crazy that they use this, but they do. And the cool thing is that since Gmail generally gets security right in terms of setting up TLS and all that stuff, and they have tons of IP addresses, um, if you can log into Gmail securely, you can now download a copy of Tor over SSL that does not involve us at all in terms of SSL certificates, and then you can verify the PGP signature to know that it's us. Bootstrapping problem solved. OK, problem now is that then those governments block Tor. So they block Tor by downloading that list. They put it in the firewall. Um, there are a couple of places where we've heard where they actually block Tor by disallowing the entire internet and then selectively allowing things that you can get to. That sucks. That's really hard to beat. But we were, we'll, we'll beat that too, eventually. Um, one way to do that is that you find out all the places that are allowed and then you approach them and say, hi, I noticed that you're allowed through this really like incredibly important firewall and like we would like you to run a Tor relay also on this exact same IP address and port number and here's how you can do that. We have not yet approached anyone to do that. Um, really, it's just big banks that are worried about like document leaks or something like that. But um, funny that. Um, so that's not really high on the uh, initiative list, but it's up there. So usually, like for example, in China, we publish you know our, our consensus, and about every you know few months they take this consensus and then they block it. And they block it based on port and IP. There's a funny unintended consequence, which is that if you then try to use the Tor network to visit China. Um, you're blocked because you're using the Tor network to connect back in instead of the other way. So that's, it depends on where you're trying to go, but there's like all these unintended consequences that, that happen as a result. We hadn't anticipated that one entirely. It's uh, kind of funny, um, but it doesn't always work. There are some places that will try to block the Tor network and um, they will only do blocking outgoing. And so you can actually use the Tor network to get into their country anonymously, but you can't use the Tor network to get out. And it's neat because you can actually sort of learn about the like disgusting authoritarian mindset where you realize that it's like they're really building a fence facing inward. And there's no question because their network architecture reveals their political standpoint. 
And so it's really interesting to observe that because you can just like you can tell so much about a country culturally based on how it treats its citizens politically on the internet. So it's totally fascinating. I mean, that's like a whole talk all in itself because there's lots of countries that just have these like really weird network policies. Um, so um, I'm a big fan of the anarchist principle of mutual aid and another one, solidarity. And so there's a solution, which is that we all have friends. So we should ask our friends for help, right? This is the lesson we learn in kindergarten about sharing. Um, so here's how it works. Alice wants to connect to the relay, but Alice can't connect to the relay because some government somewhere blocks them. And so instead, um, what Alice will do is talk to her friend Bob, the bridge. And uh, yeah, it's cute, right? And uh, so Bob the Bridge is like, oh, hello, Alice. The Chinese government doesn't know about me, or the Iranian government doesn't know about me, or the US government, or the Canadian, you know, all the different countries that censor. And um, you connect through Bob the Bridge, and then Bob the Bridge connects you to Relay too. And the thing that's beautiful about this is that Bob the Bridge is not trusted for anything except for accessibility. So you have all the same properties of the Tor network where you don't trust the first hop at all. So this is like as if Bob had run an HTTP proxy for you. But the cool thing is that Bob doesn't run an HTTP proxy. Bob runs this anonymizing proxy for you. And Bob can choose to only share it with you. So only if he tells you directly about it or something like over Twitter or some other place, um, only then will you learn about it. That makes it really hard for the sensors to detect it unless they use protocol inspection itself. So now we've taken it from um, how do we keep a government from learning about all of the possible IP addresses of the Tor network, which is impossible, to how do we uh, make it so that friend sharing an IP address um, you know, won't, uh, won't be instantly detected. And that's actually a solvable problem in that people can share these and they work. So even in places where Tor is blocked very heavily and they actively look for bridges, um, this private bridge mode, where Bob only shares it with Alice, works perfectly well. And in every place except for Iran right now, and I'll talk about Iran in a second. Um, but basically, um, there's also a public bridge mode, which submits your bridge descriptors to a private list. And this gets a little bit, a little bit wonky, because it's really important to note that usually people, when they try to do things in secrecy with regards to anonymity networks, what they really mean is, like, that problem was too hard, we're not going to solve it. And so we're just going to punt and say, like, oh, we, we, we solved it. And so it's really important to be very skeptical of those types of things because people are full of it usually, especially when they're talking about privacy. They're like, oh, trust us. And the problem with that is that I don't trust anybody, right? And Because if I did, I wouldn't need an anonymity network in the first place. <laughs> and um, so Bob the Bridge can be a public or a private bridge. And you can go to bridges.torproject.org as a website, and you'll get a bridge descriptor, which is an IP address and a cryptographic fingerprint, maybe a name. Or you can send an email to bridges at torproject.org and we'll respond. And so if you, of course, go with a Tor browser, like a, a browser configured with Tor, and you connect um, to that, we treat you as one geographic area. If you come from China, we give you different ones. We have different buckets, and then we split them up. So we shard the data so it's a lot harder for one person to just crawl this and get every single bridge. Um, not perfect. The Chinese government has done this. They have crawled all of them actively and blocked them, every single one that's available. And they've also set up Gmail bots and like send out emails and Luckily, the sensors aren't actually sharing this data, so each government has to recreate this work, which is hilarious. <laughs> so some of them don't do a very good job, and some of the IP addresses change. Um, so there's a lot of churn in this, and this is sort of a solution. Another really awesome idea is we're, we're working on this thing. It's called pluggable transport, and the idea is that you have a network connection, and you can connect to a server somewhere, and it's willing to relay data to anywhere for you. So maybe what you do is you plug in the, the Skype pluggable transport network, or you plug in something else. And uh, basically, the idea there is that you will be able to get to a bridge by another protocol. And so the protocol is only about accessibility, then the bridge is about anonymity and accessibility to the anonymity network, and then the anonymity network provides all those other things. Whew. All right. So now we know how we can connect to the Tor network. Um, so like I said, um, if you send an email to Bridges a Tor project, we'll just give you a bridge. And this is great also because it means you have a little bit of um, deniability. So for example, you connect to um, the Tor project via a satellite link in Egypt. If you connect directly, it's possible they can in real time fingerprint and say that's a Tor connection um, just based on the IP headers. So that could be bad. So maybe if you use a bridge, it's better because then they don't instantly know by the IP alone that you're Tor. They have to go into the packets a little bit. Now, maybe because you're using uh, like a satellite connection that's pointing up to the sky, that's a lot harder to intercept the handshake and the setup. And so <clears throat> some protocol specific things would be hidden. Um, so 
I'm going to just like whiz through these really quickly, because otherwise I'm going to be here until 4. <laughs> so, OK, uh, you heard about the Egypt thing that's happening right now, which you know is really important. I cannot stress how important that is. And uh, the number of relays around the time that this uh, unpleasantness started basically jumped from a, you know just a little bit over 2,000 to the place where it's at right now, which is about uh, 23, 25 nodes in the network. Uh, and that's a pretty big deal. And you can see the bridges also jumped um, a number. Like we went basically from a solid 500 to about 700 and something nodes. Um, so the different nodes have different properties. So for example, those nodes that started um, that started running, you'll note that they're running and fast. So a bunch of people put a bunch of really fast nodes that allow exiting to the whole internet up on the network. So there's like several hundred nodes that were just added basically overnight. They're actually useful for everyone in the whole world. And that's the cool thing is when you have an anonymity network that's shared by everyone, it's not just the Fed anonymity network. Like as a, a slight anecdote, I once met an FBI agent who said, oh, Tor is crap. You shouldn't use that. We have our own FBI anonymity network. I was like, oh, great. That sounds awesome. Tell me about it. He's like, well, so, you know, we have our own anonymity network. So, you know, we, when we have to do an investigation, we like, you know, click on links and we go through that. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. So I send you a link, right? And it's only sent to you and you're an FBI agent. It's like, yeah, it's fine. And I investigate it. I'm like, oh, great. So when you connect from that network, there's no question that you're a cop. It's like, oh, you know, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> so, well, there's, there's a reason that you work at the FBI. So, um, so you know, I don't have the body to be a fireman. So, uh, so um, and then you can also see, like, relay platforms. So, like, a lot of them are Linux, uh, Linux systems. So we went from about 1,200 Linux systems to somewhere around 1,500, 1,600. Um, and then here's a graph of our Tor users. And again, all this data is open. And we would really love it if people would look through this data, because um, I'm sure that we're not perfect. We're so far from perfect, it's not even funny. But this, this data is there for people to analyze, because we really want people to, to know that the thing that is important to us is a shared anonymity network that everybody's using. So you can't learn about someone just by knowing that they're using it. Um, and here's the number of bridges. This is kind of an interesting thing, people connecting via bridges. We can actually detect blocking events or weird anomalies by seeing a drop-off like that. We can also detect anomalies in our statistical gathering with drop-offs like that. Now, which one it was, I have no idea. But um, you can learn a lot, of course, by monitoring these things. And of course, the elephant in the network uh, is Egypt. So recently, the thing that occurred um, was that the Egyptian government just basically like went off the rails in the direction they were actually going for 30 years. Um, but they just started like doing some pretty like heinous stuff in the open. And people realized that this was an issue. Um, about a year and a half ago, I went to Cairo and I trained a bunch of human rights activists, you know, people that work in the Egyptian Supreme Court or other places to, for social justice. Uh, I trained them about using Tor and OTR and how to use SSL and encrypting stuff and observation and cell phone tracking and just like a whole host of things that you would want to know about if you were, I don't know, going to get shot in the head into your square. So um, that's what happened. A whole bunch of people realized, hey, I, I remember learning this thing, and my friend told me about this thing, and I really need that right now. And so we saw this gigantic spike. We basically like quadrupled the number of users in Egypt overnight. Absolutely fantastic. And then you might have heard that the Egyptian government, in response to people using the internet to show the world the crimes they were committing against uh, the Egyptian people, they cut the internet off almost entirely. I had control of a bunch of routers in Egypt at the time, not Tor routers, but other routers. Thank you, Cisco. And uh, basically, I can confirm, like, the internet just like dropped off like that. There were a few core things, like the Egyptian Stock Exchange and a few other machines that were left online. The Library of Alexandria, for example, was one of the last things online because it had a lease line to Europe. Because Brewster, the guy that runs archive.org, he is a genius. And he realized that this is exactly what would happen. You know, his, his said, I think his quote about the history of libraries is that governments burn them down. Right? So he, he planned ahead. Um, ironically, they had free Wi-Fi and they turned it off during the conflict, which is quite sad. Um, I don't know why they did that. I assume probably because of real serious threats of violence. Um, good news, though, the internet is coming back. So these statistics are, you know, they're a day old or so. But the internet is returning. You know, Egypt is BGP peering again with lots of people. Um, but also we saw a giant increase in bridges and again the drop off. Even when the internet was almost entirely down, there were still users um, users in Egypt. And so it's actually the case that um, even when the internet was like totally crippled and people thought Egypt was completely offline, it wasn't entirely offline. The Ministry of Information was still connected through internet too, which is kind of an interesting thing. So the Ministry of Information, as I understand it, 
are the people that are, um, I guess they're sort of like the NSA equivalent, sort of a little bit. I'm not entirely clear on the mapping of the different groups, but um, needless to say, my friends that were getting shot at into here square, they said that they don't like the Ministry of Information. And so it is not too surprising that the Ministry of Information was the last, uh, last man standing, so to speak, on that network. It was funny that the Internet Archive uh, was also on the network, but it was on flag and it was directly connected with the lease line. So they were just probably overlooked entirely. Um, so just real quick. Was the spike um, as a result of because the government shut down the Internet and if people were just trying to communicate or because people were trying to communicate anonymously? That's before the Internet was shut down. This is like a bunch of people realizing, I assume, collectively, oh, man, they are probably logging the Internet. I have a video that shows a crime that is very serious, and I do not want to be the source of this video because I want to be free of reprisal. I want to be free of someone trying to harm me in response for telling the truth. And so tons of people are using this. And I think that's like, uh, that's a, that to me, like, really, like, warms the heart. Like, to see that makes me feel like I haven't wasted my life working on this stuff. Because it's, it's really easy to think that nobody needs anonymity. But that's a position of privilege that many of us are afforded, that we can talk about what we are. Like, I can say that I'm queer, and no one's going to, like, kill me over that. It's totally fine. And, you know, most of my friends, they don't have that when they're in these places. Like, my friend in Tahir Square is an atheist. He's the only <laughs> apostate I've ever met in my entire life in the Arab world. He uses Tor a lot. And he does so because if he reads websites in Egypt, and he works with other network administrators. If someone sniffed him watching uh, a video of Richard Dawkins, he'd probably get fired instantly. And, and that's a like, really serious thing. And obviously, people that were involved in uprising or reading about the uprising didn't want to instantly flag themselves as doing that. So they used Tor. And many of them used Tor bridges as well. Um, I don't want to say that this played a big role in the thing that's happening right now, because like that's 2,000 people, and there are hundreds of thousands of people, a million people in Tahir Square or something like that. So this is just like a small piece. But I'd like to think that people that used it got the properties that we claim, and then it keeps them safe when they're using it. There's tons of other problems. If you take a, like if you take a video and you put that video online, your sensor leaves a, a unique fingerprint, the noise in your sensor itself. So you're totally in trouble that way. Um, I've heard about bloggers being arrested in Asia for that exact situation. So that's, I mean, it's very serious. Side channel attacks are very serious. But th the low, the lowest common denominator here is just IP addresses. Like Shi Tao was put in prison because Yahoo logged his IP address. And using the IP address, when it was disclosed, the Chinese government got him and put him in jail for 10 years for sending an email. And so in addition to Yahoo's totally negligent data retention policy that resulted in someone losing 10 years of their life, um, it's clear that that alone, just IP addresses, is enough to get people put in prison. And so this alone is enough to keep people out of prison in that exact circumstance, uh, especially if they're connecting to other places that would uh, give that data up readily to the Egyptian government. All right, so um, in Iran, uh, and I, like I want to stress, like I'm actually not xenophobic at all. I'm not a nationalist, even in like the least. I believe that humanity as one is like way more important than a nation state of one. and um, I'm focusing on some of these countries because I think that they make really interesting predictions for our future here and the future of the internet everywhere. So for example, in Iran, the police, the national police chief actually talked about uh, people sending SMSs and emails and using proxies. And he says that they won't prevent identification if they continue those who organize or issue appeals about opposition protests have committed a crime worse than those who take to the streets. So that's the seriousness of which they treat the internet. And, and, and that can't, uh, this creation of, of, of a filter net, as, as some people have called it, is not, not to be taken just as blocking, but filter as in observing to catch. Like they want to filter people out so that they can harm them. I've, I've heard about people having their Gmail accounts printed out and handed to them by the Iranian authorities before they're tortured, right? So it's like very serious observation problem in some of these countries. And you know, the United States government does a lot of wiretapping as well. And the difference is that they just use that as a lead-in to then getting legal warrants so that they can introduce the warrants uh, to do wiretapping to collect more information so they can introduce that in court. They have a different, they have a different strategy, but it's still in a, in a very similar way, like far, far away from the liberty that we enjoyed 100 years ago. And that's, I'd like to return to 100 years ago in terms of data privacy. And so Tor is an attempt at that, of course. Um, there's a lot of cyber panic 
and I like you know to stress the word cyber a bunch of times about that cyber 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 um, and China and it's like kind of I, I find it like kind of disgusting because it's actually just wrapped up racism and nationalism like actually China is not bad right there's like a billion people in China and you can't sum it up by just using one word um, and so I mean when I talk about China I'm only interested in it from the fact that they're blocking the Tor network on our website but I don't like actually have a problem with China as a whole. I mean, I have some issues with their politics, but that's not Tor, that's me. And um, I, I think it's really important to have a rational discussion about cybersecurity, and it's really hard when people use the word cyber. So, uh, <laughs> like, what is that? Like, the internet, hello. Um, so here's a, an example. So the Chinese government had an anniversary, 60th anniversary of some guy taking power in their country. And um, that was, uh, yeah, so September 24th or so, you see we had um, a bunch of people connecting to a server that I control in Amsterdam. Um, and Carsten Losing has made all these graphs. He's this amazing German who's fantastic at making graphs of all this statistical data. So we had like somewhere around you know, 10, 12, you know, 8,000 people or something. And then all of a sudden, boom, a zero. And then a little blip, does their filter maybe have a little blip there? which was kind of nice when their filters have blips like that because you can sort of learn. I mean, it's great because they're like living things. Trying to censor the internet is like trying to censor an organism that sees censorship as damage, as John Gilmore would put it, and then routes around it. And so it's nice because you can see that right there they had a little bit of a, a machine uprising. So, <laughs> um, so, um, so we were like, oh, geez, this is awful. What will we do? But we had already planned ahead with Bridges, and we had been telling people for a while that this was going to happen, and we knew that this was a cat and mouse game. And um, so we were like, gosh, what will happen? Well, the norm in anonymity and circumvention is that you download a new copy of the program. Well, that distribution problem is really hard. We already learned that. And we have hundreds of thousands of people using Tor. So if every time this happened, we had to download something new, that'd be bad news. It wouldn't work. So Bridges were great because we taught people in China and people all around the world taught their friends to use Bridges. And they now, instead of having to get a new program, they just need to get a single IP address. Boom, next day, right? So direct connect, Bridges, whoop, 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 right? Um, so that's fantastic, right? Because, I mean, now this is in absolute numbers and that's in percentages, so, you know, that looks really good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, and, you know, it, it is really good, but it's not, uh, it's not, so it's like September 6th is over here. So the number of bridges that this is in relation to is not even on that previous graph, but it looks good. So um, sorry about that. These are the best graphs I could come up with for China. And uh, you know, this, this is, of course, how it was going. But now the problem is that um, they have adapted, of course, as we expected. And so they regularly harvest bridges. And so in fact, the people that are in China really have to use the friend of a friend approach. We think it's secure cryptographically. We think it's good from an anonymity perspective, but that doesn't actually change the fact that they are actively hunting for ways for people to get into these networks and they treat us as an adversary. It's almost like an anonymity cold war. And it's a little bit frustrating because they're wrong. And that's all there is to it. People want to connect to this network and they're trying to block it and they should not be doing that. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with nationalities. People want to use this service, and there's so many reasons they want to use this service, and they just block them. And so this is like uh, this is a battle that unfortunately is very socially successful because some people in some countries like to say, well, you know, there are bad things on the internet, and we should block them, and they don't recognize that it creates two classes of people: people that are allowed to see what's actually happening, and people that are only allowed to see a constructed version of reality. And we have to reject that because there is an objective thing that exists, and we can observe it, and we can see it, and when you have raw data, you can make better decisions. I mean, I'm a data-driven person and a CPU-driven person, but I like to think that, you know, when I have some information, I make a better decision. I can try to make a decision on the fly, but if I have 10 years of data, I'm going to do better. But lots of governments like to hide the truth. They like to erase history as if it has never happened, and that I think is very dangerous. And you see this happening all the time, like in Iran when that girl Neto was shot in the heart by the besieged militia. And I, I, I took out my slide about her. But you know, when that happened, they want to block that video. They don't want anyone to know that they have shot unarmed civilians in the street and killed them without any due process because they felt like it. And they don't want accountability for that. So they try to erase history. And I think that that is something that is totally disgusting and we can resist it. And the way that we resist it is with systems like this, I think. So um, the Billboard Liberation Front in San Francisco <laughs> Uh, just happened to, to liberate this billboard outside my office. <laughs> Look at the draw on my part, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I really want to drive this home. 
the difference between the Iranian government and the Chinese government and the U.S. government is that the U.S. government censorship is very pervasive and it's mostly related to monitoring. Um, and usually when the American government kills people, it's because they're brown. And so it's really important to note that they are not that different. It's just how they apply their violence is a little bit different. And that's something that to me is very depressing. Like the fact that the NSA was able to collaborate with AT&T and other phone companies to warrantlessly wiretap all of America and that the US government largely threw that out because not a single person was affected because it was everyone is really, really, really scary. The Stasi had nothing on the intercept capabilities of what the United States has on all of us in this room right now, from cell phone locations to real-time voice analysis, all that stuff. It's terrifying. And the problem with systems like that is not that today they aren't being abused, it's that tomorrow they will be abused because someone will go and work on those systems and they will use them for economic espionage, they'll use them for harm. Like yesterday there was a guy who uh, was apparently dismissed from his job as a border guard because <laughs> He had put his wife on a do not fly list because he wanted to break up with her. So three years she couldn't fly. And because there's no, there's no system of accountability there, she's just like out of the country. Of course, I think they've had a divorce now and it's quite clear where he stands. Um, <laughs> but those types of systems without transparency are very scary. I mean, I am fairly certain that the NSA is tasked with listening to me. And there's, uh, you know, that is a really heavy psychological burden to bear. And it's quite scary. And this is the world that we're creating, and I pay for it with my own tax dollars, and I have no accountability from the government. And that's very scary to me. And so, you know, it's socially successful in places like China, potentially. And it's also socially successful here. And that is very scary, because if you look at the agency that we have, it's not clear how we can change that. Because it's, you know, I voted for Obama. Like, what a disaster that was. Um, no change there. I mean, I would hope that he would do something about it, but instead he has chosen not to. And that's, that's very frustrating to me. Um, so I know that I'm about finished, so I just wanted to go, I mentioned that there's some cool stuff you can do. So um, I don't think that I invented it. I think maybe I reinvented it, but I found that these filters, um, the deep packet inspection is a little bit different, but generally speaking, the way that this works is if you want to detect a, if you want to detect a firewall um, on a network, and I don't have access to one of these networks right now, I, I wish that I did. If I had access to one in Saudi, it would be the perfect example. Um, but basically what you can do is you can take a multi-protocol uh, uh, approach. So um, let's say you have a host on the internet and you know that it's blocked. And that website is torproject.org. And so you do a trace route to that. Well, ICMP trace routes go all the way at 16 hops long. That's exactly what you would expect. But you make a connection that says, sorry, this page is not available. It's like, well, how do they do that? Yeah, that's uh, you know, kind of cool. There's some elite hacker stuff there. You know, and then it turns out the answer is that you can do a thing that I've called TTL walking. And um, I'm going to write a paper about this with UDA because now that I have a job there, I guess I'm supposed to write papers. Um, but basically, uh, the idea is to walk from each hop on the network. So you say, I want to make a TCP request, SIN, and you send a SIN, but you set the TTL to be 1. Does it get blocked? Do you get a response? You continue that, right? So n plus one, and you continue all the way through. And it turns out in about hop six in Saudi Arabia, you get a TCP back. That's strange, because we know that it's 16 hops with ICMP. How did they get a cross connect in the middle of Saudi Arabia's telecom to my web server? And the answer is that somewhere in between uh, hop zero, U, and hop n, they have a thing that sniffs and diverts. Or Hop N, in fact, is a sniffing and diverting box, or it simply just hijacks all connections. Turns out that what you can do is you can do a TCP trace route to port 0, which most people don't even realize is a valid TCP port, to 123, which is network time. Nobody does network time protocol analysis at all. That's like the most forgotten about old time protocol in the world. It does NAT traversal and all sorts of crazy stuff, and it's bad code. Um, so <laughs> anybody that's running that is just like security nightmare for a different reason. But um, then you do it for port 80. You do it for port 443, and you do an ICMP trace route. And with those together, you look at the differences, and you can simply say 16 hops, 5 hops. We know that the filter is exactly here, at least where they hijack the connection. Now, it could be many hops before. With ICMP, you can, of course, spoof the responses. Like, for example, it was the case a long time ago that people would spoof the responses um, for Scientology. So when you would trace route to the anti-Scientology websites that publish their documents, it would actually trace route all the way back to Scientology headquarters because they were, like, that Scientology people didn't understand how networks work. So they would, like, call up their own ISPs and get really angry and then cut their own internet connection off. Um, <laughs> we're really good. We're going to sue you if you don't cut this off. And then, of course, like, whoops. Uh -huh. So um, 
So you can use the same trick um, to find this. And the other thing you can do is latency. Latency measuring is something that's totally possible because if you know that it takes 300 milliseconds to get somewhere, someone can always increase the latency of the place that you're going to, but they can never shorten it. And so if you get a response and the response is 10 milliseconds away, but you know the hop is 300 milliseconds away, you know someone is hijacking it 10 milliseconds away, you can probably calculate distance. If the speed of light is constant, like we think it is, then probably it's the case that you can figure out the exact cabling distance between you and a sensor. And I mean, I haven't written that up either, but it would probably be worth, I mean, both of those are probably, you know, some contribution to something. Um, and packet keyword injection is also interesting. So uh, now you take that same TTL walking technique and you put inside of the keyword for China, for example, Falun Gong. And now you walk and you find the sniffing point that triggers an inject. And then you get TCP reset. And then also the nice thing is that if you have raw packet access, you can inject whatever you want into that. And you can get the firewall to send traffic for you. So like, for example, if you send a DNS packet that is a query for a domain that they want to censor or that contains a string that you know is blocked and you spoof the source address, then the firewall will respond. And it will respond even if you're sending it to an IP address that's just on the other side of the firewall that even isn't a DNS server. So it just scoops it out and then fires off some responses. And so the really hilarious thing that you can do in a situation like that is you can get these firewalls to packet themselves. So you can basically inject some data into the network and then the network will attack itself because it's, you know, it, it's alive, right? It has come alive and it's attacking. Um, and you can, of course, do this with known bad URLs. There's all sorts of really interesting probing techniques here. And it's really fantastic because these guys always lose because the internet was designed to catch losers like this. And, and to route around them. And so it's possible to detect them in these ways and then more. And so I'm working on uh, a project which, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not going to tell you the name of it yet, but um, the idea is to do this and to give all the software away for free and to give all the censorship lists away for free and to give all the data away for free so that we can have real honest conversations about who is doing what. So for example, maybe this is a trade barrier. Like, why is it that you block Google in your country? Maybe that's something that's quite serious. That's the equivalent of, like, no longer allowing our redwood trees to, you know, go through here or not allowing cattle or something like that. I mean, the free flow of information is pretty serious. So with this kind of stuff, we can learn about that and we can probe. And it's always a losing game for them because we can always get devices in their country one way or the other. Uh, so here's one in Saudi. So, Jake, yep. We're over time in five minutes. Do you want to just wrap up? Yeah, the, it's just a couple screenshots. Yeah, so here's Saudi, and you can actually see up here the URL, and the URL that's up at the top, you can actually tell that that is uh, a US-made filter. I think this is smart filter. I'm not totally certain, but you can actually tell by the URL because there's a sniffer and an injector, and it injects a redirect to a particular website, and it's a race condition, and since it's closer, it always redirects you. Um, Lebanon uses squid. Um, which is hilarious. It's an inline squid proxy. It's a lot cheaper. And the reason that it's hilarious is because it's overloaded. And so it barely works, even when you're not blocked. Um, this is Qatar, and it's, again, the same device as you see uh, in, in Saudi. Um, and so there's lots of things we can improve about the way we do SSL and TLS, and I can talk about that if anyone cares about the inside baseball aspects of that. Um, and of course, we can do better probing in order to understand blockage. Um, yeah, anyway, so questions? <laughs> and thanks for letting me go over time. Like, I'm sure my inflammatory statements about the NSA could have been like left out to make more time for other things, but that's important too. So, anybody have any questions? Sure. With the uh, upcoming implementation of IP version 6 and the allocation of those addresses based on geographical location, uh, will that affect the way Tor works and or the blocking mechanisms in place? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be quick about it. So, yep. Are, are you doing anything to improve the latency? Last time I used it, it was just really slow. Oh, you know, I, I lost that slide. That's very annoying. Um, not a joke about packet loss, actually, but I, I have a slide about that, and it actually shows the latency. So, like, the, we on our metrics.torproject.org site, we actually we regularly download files through Tor, and then uh, we can tell you about latency issues and throughput issues. So we can say it takes you know uh, 25 seconds on average to download a five megabyte file, 
And, and we know that that is something we, we're working on. And we've actually been increasingly, as relays are added to the network, you actually see the graph go down. So it actually gets faster. Now, is it faster uh, overall? I think the answer is yes. Tor has gotten a lot faster, especially because we have people that are really passionate about some of the things that are related to the real world, things that are happening, where they're running relays. Like I have a relay that pushes a gigabit of traffic a second. And that makes the network a lot faster. There's an interesting uh, other thing, which is that I mentioned Egypt and satellite stuff. Um, satellite communication systems are really strange because they're really slow to begin with. And usually you have to have a TCP accelerator. And I have this theory, which is that Tor will act as a natural TCP accelerator. Because once you've established your TCP connection to um, the first relay, all you do is shuffle bytes back and forth. And so if you just want to stream 512 byte packets, out to a satellite and back down to the ground station, that's going to go way faster. And you multiplex all your TCP connections through the SOX proxy, and that's going to be a lot faster. So in that case, if you use Tor on a satellite connection, the circuit of the satellite is going to be far slower than the latency of the rest of the Tor stuff. But of course, you add it all together. Um, and so it's mostly about perception. And I would encourage you to change your perception by using Tor more often <laughs> and running a relay. Um, you mentioned earlier about using traceroute to use of analysis on firewalls. Something you might be interested in, uh, some papers uh, or a series of papers a while back discussed a technique called firewalking. Mm -hmm. And I just found uh, it's pa uh, the paper firewalking a trace route like analysis of IT packet responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, NMAP um, implements that. So um, that might be something to look into. Uh, it reminded me, isn't that similar to the technique they were using for net neutrality analysis? Mm. The Switzerland thing by the EFF, you mean? Yeah. Um, so kind of, but not really. Okay. Um, because in this case, um, the way that I implement it, so I actually am quite familiar with Fedor, the guy that wrote NMAP, and there is a firewalking program as a script that comes with NMAP, and I have used that in these situations. Um, they do not implement exactly what I have done. They are very similar, and I was kind of like annoyed that I hadn't like done a little more research beforehand, but I still think it's novel because it, no one has a thing that says, this hop is where you're censored. Um, they say like, well, there's a weird difference between the way these protocols or ports are filtered. And they do that for like NAT detection, for example. Um, and so um, firewalking is quite useful. And then as far as, uh, as its application here, I think that it needs to be expanded a little bit because you actually have to take into account the fact that there's like keywords and, and stuff. There's like, ma there are magical flags that have nothing to do with TCP that are triggered by the deep packet inspection devices. And those also have to be integrated into that. And so there's a lot a lot more work in that direction. So, but thank you for that. It's good. Anybody else? Uh, this is more related to privacy than, than in general than Tor specifically. You're kind of in a unique position. Uh, and so moving forward, the, the situation in this country, if it got worse and if it started to turn into just similar situations to, to what we're seeing today in other parts of the world. You are very privacy and security conscious. Mm -hmm. I've read some interviews with you where you talk about the steps you take to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, could you, uh, I guess, give some basic general tips for the average person that was concerned about their privacy? Yeah, get a better government. That's the answer. <laughs> I'm, serious. I'm serious, right? When I fly to America, I'm detained right. and I'm interrogated. Right, that's like that's my everyday reality, and uh, it's awful, absolutely awful. I can't carry a laptop across the border because the border search exception, according to the customs people, says that they don't have to do anything by the book. They can do whatever they want. So they'll take my stuff, backdoor my hardware, probably, maybe an upcoming paper on that. Uh, right, that's like that's a really that's a that's a really serious problem, and you cannot defeat that with technological measures alone. There's just no question. Like this cell phone is a tracking device, right, and the cell phone companies are gagged. So they can't tell me that I have a warrant on my telephone or that Kalia is being activated. And the baseband radio on the cell phone can be turned on remotely. And I can't do anything about that because it's closed source software in the baseband. I mean, I can do something by disassembling it in Ida Pro, but probably not, right? And you really can't beat these types of adversaries because they're total and all encompassing. And in fact, you pay for them to exist. And so like, what can you do? You can run Tor to protect yourself against data retention issues that are definitely going to be the next part. I mean, we're emerging into the second crypto wars. And one of the big things in the second crypto wars is going to be about data retention. And another one will, again, be about key escrow and cryptography. And another issue will be about anonymity. And so, I mean, I encourage you to try to leave as little of a trace as possible. But know that it's a losing game because of the network effect, right? If all your friends use Facebook and you use Facebook, 
everybody knows what parties you're invited to and what you're going to. And if you don't use Facebook, you don't get invited to those parties. You don't exist anymore. And right? I'm not on Facebook, and people are always like, why didn't you come to my party? I'm like, well, because I'm not on Facebook. And apparently that's your party line, right? So um, you can basically just you know, become the guy in the woods digitally. And even then, you still don't win. Because there's all this other data that's collected about you, and no one has any differential privacy practices that are actually practical or interesting. And you know, like medical records, the way that I mean, I like, like I like the fact that people are going to have access to medical care, but there's a big problem with electronic medical records, which is that nobody knows anything about computer security at all. And it's like my doctor can't even figure out what's wrong with me when I'm sick. How is he going to figure out if his computer isn't doing all right? Right? It's a disaster. And so it's like. There's a trade-off there. And I think, and I mean, as a political anarchist, I think it's hilarious that I'm going to say this, but I think the answer is law. And, and I think the answer is that good laws will protect us, but only if people that are, are governing us and, and, and that we, as participants in this, are actually um, following that law. Only that will be helpful. Like, technical countermeasures are just that. They're just countermeasures. And they won't actually solve all these problems. But one thing I would say is, like, don't use Facebook. Right? They use NARS equipment, which I believe is, maybe that's public? I think they use NARS equipment. I'll, I'll go with that. And that is you know, the same stuff that uh, AT&T uses for wiretapping. They do this for analysis, right? Their business model is to know everything about you, to sell you stuff. But you better believe there are people that are in that organization that, um, let's see, how do I say this without getting sued? There are people in that organization that don't have your best interests at heart. And they might come from a variety of different places. And there are lots of things on the internet that are like that. And so you have to be careful. I mean, it's, uh, it's a scary world out there. So being so, careful is totally variable. Like, you, you know, if you, don't, if you don't want to disconnect from Facebook, your level of careful is different than mine. Like, I, I don't use Facebook. I use Twitter. Everything there is public. That's the trade-off that I've made. So everybody knows everything that I'm doing when I post it online. And when I use the internet, I try to use Tor as much as possible. I try to only use services that are end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, I look for active man-in-the-middle attacks. I use Red Phone with Android to make end-to-end -end encrypted calls. I use Text Secure to send encrypted text messages. And these different protocols have perfect forward secrecy, but like, let's not kid. Like, this is a walking spy device, and it's not hard to get code execution on this. So just the fact that I pretend that I'm okay from one adversary of you know, passive attacks. There's the whole fact that there's a digital arms industry. Uh, I think the term is cyber war. Uh, and um, <laughs> You know, the cyber war industry, if you will, um, you know, has a zero day exploits that they sell for every platform and every piece of software. The, our Genesis zero day pack, along with Core Impact, pretty much guaranteed to break into almost any computer network or computer. And if you can just get to the network, you can sniff and you are lost. So, I mean, practically, law is the answer, I think. And I can't believe that that's the answer. It really breaks my heart. Like, I want, I want technology to help us, but it's not technology alone. These right. things do not exist in a vacuum. So just as a quick follow-up, what, and you said the majority, but what percentage of your internet, internet traffic when a Tor client is available goes over Tor? Is it 100%? So um, it is not 100% because I have some different trade-offs than other people. I have multiple Tor clients running. So IRC goes over Tor. My chat clients all go over Tor. Every time there's SSL or TLS available, I use Tor, and I don't, and I cache the certificate, so I'm not using certificate authorities. Um, but some things, like when I connect to um, Twitter, for example, Twitter's SSL mode is broken because the people that work at Twitter don't, they're not open to constructive criticism about their failures. And um, like they could have unblocked Egypt before Egypt went off the internet. I worked with their engineer to find out what was going on, and I was like, these two IP addresses are not blocked in Egypt quickly redirect all of the Twitter traffic in Egypt to those IP addresses, and Twitter's back online. And he said, well, we're not going to get involved. And this conversation never happened. I said, OK. Uh, so I mean, that's, you know, that's it's, uh, very frustrating. And so as a result, I do use some single hop proxies that are SSH that I SSH to over Tor. And then there's a SOX proxy on top of that so that when those websites leak because they're put together badly, um, I don't leak that to Tor. Um, and as a result, like, my login list looks pretty much like just one long list of a single IP address. And that's because my threat model there is not about anything except location anonymity and uh, leaking my credentials to a certain site. So. Thanks. Yeah. Let's thank Jake one more time and if people want to stick around.